you know, I love optometry so much and it's benefited me so much in my life. So I'm like, I want to push this profession forward and I want me and my fellow classmates to be able to practice in the way that we're taught. I think we have this huge opportunity as optometrists to kind of step up and prove what we're able to do. Hello and welcome to the I Give a Damn podcast, brought to you by Floresy Media, the same company behind ODs on Facebook. I'm your host, Dr. Joseph Allen, and today we get to hear from Maggie Dunn, who is a current fourth year extern and the new recipient of the American Optometric Association's Student of the Year Award. And I think today's episode is super interesting to hear a fourth year's perspective on major topics that are affecting optometry, including student interest in private practice, in residency, how national board scores have been changing, and ultimately how changing scope of practice across the country may influence or persuade a student to or away from practicing in a given state. By the way, it's gonna be a good conversation. So without further ado, hit those like and subscribe buttons, and here we go with Maggie Dunn. Before we dive into the episode, I do want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, MacuHealth. If you've been following my content, then you know how deeply passionate I am about ocular health, as well as improving and protecting the eyesight of our patients in the clinic. MacuHealth is known for their triple carotenoid formula, lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And whether you're concerned about age-related macular degeneration, or just want to help your patients with the nutrients they need to stay sharp, MacuHealth has you covered. We'll talk about Macu Health again a little bit later in the episode, but otherwise, let's get going. Maggie Dunn, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. This is, uh, you are the first student we've had here on the podcast. How does that, how does that make you feel? I'm excited. I've never done a podcast before, so thank you so much for having me. With this, uh, right now you were here at Optometry's meeting recording. You have just received the award, or you're about to, mm -hmm. right? Late, later, is it this evening? It's, uh, I get like a little bit of recognition tonight, and then tomorrow morning I give my speech. So you are the American Optometric Association's Student mm -hmm. of the Year Award. Congrats. Yes, thank you so much. That's <laughs> huge. Can you tell us this? I'm, I'm curious of your experience getting that award like how did you find out about mm -hmm. it did you know that you were even nominated mm -hmm. what was that like so i had no idea none at all i so the ohio optometric association nominated me um her name is corey mccabe she's like um she kind of works heavily like kind of coordinating things she's on the board um she reached out to me and asked for my resume but i kind of thought it was just going to be like a newsletter recognizing me for some of the work that i did i didn't really know why she wanted it um but i sent it her way and that was kind of all i heard of it and then emily benson who is a former ohio state grad and now a practicing doctor um she called me and she was telling me like I'm sure you're aware of this. And I was like, not at all. And she's like, well, you won. And I was very, very surprised. I'm super grateful for the opportunity and the recognition. I would have literally never expected this in my entire life. So um, it's kind of been a whirlwind situation, just kind of hearing the call and then like coordinating all the details and like being asked to be on a podcast and, you know, getting like a video filmed and pictures taken and all that has been like so foreign to me, but so exciting. Now you mentioned that you you got maybe asked or to submit your CV and all mm -hmm. that because of some work that you've mm -hmm. done. Can you fill us on and fill us in on what you've been doing that maybe has brought you to this to receiving mm -hmm. this award? Yeah, so at Ohio State, I was um, the AOSA's president. Um, so we had a trustee and a president who worked together at Ohio State just because our AOSA is so big um, and so active. They kind of wanted to have two leadership roles. Um, and so I ran for president when I was a second year, I believe. Um, and it got like president elect and then you kind of rise to the president position. Um, and so I kind of did that. And um, before that, I was kind of a rep for AOSA. Um, and so I kind of was the president, and so I've gotten heavily involved working with the Ohio Optometric Association, doing a lot of their legislative action, um, going to legislators down at our state house, talking to them about um, our bill for scope expansion. Um, I've organized many events, coordinating students getting together, things like that through the AOSA. I also served as the Ohio Optometric Political Action Committee's student liaison, um, which if nobody's aware of like a PAC committee, it's the people who kind of gain funding in order to kind of push legislation forward. Um, and so I was the student liaison and I still kind of serve in that role right now. And I did that for probably two years now. And um, that has gotten me involved heavily in like the legislative process, going to like various legislators 
kind of offices, speaking with them about scope expansion in Ohio, our like scope of practice, the the things we wish for in the future, mm-hmm. kind of modernizing our like scope here. Um, but Can, that was just kind of AOSA. <laughs> let me ask you, what has that been like as a student going to meet legislatures mm-hmm. and talking about things like scope expansion when mm-hmm. you are still just a student? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell us kind of what, what has some of your experiences been meeting legislatures? What's your, what's your take on that? Every time I've ever met the legislators, they're more excited and eager to speak with the students, mm-hmm. which is kind of interesting. So I've always felt like I had a chance to like speak with them and tell them what I'm currently learning in school. Um, they're very interested in kind of hearing from us because we are learning these procedures. Um, I've fired a YAG laser. I've taken a proficiency on it. I've done an SLT in sort of a fake scenario, but I've had a proficiency on it and use these like schematic eyes, but in similar process, set the laser up, learned how to fire it properly. I have done a paracentesis on a cow eye. So we're doing these procedures that we're wishing to get in the future. Um, So they're really interested hearing that kind of the education is modernizing. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of nice for me to be able to say like our education is being modernized, but for some reason our scope of practice hasn't been. And so we're wishing to be able to do that in the state and all of the surrounding states of Ohio have the ability to practice like that. Um, Indiana is one of them, I believe. Um, I think Virginia might also have it. Kentucky, I know, does. So it's like all of these people around us, but in Ohio, we can't. And so there's kind of this, you know, we're kind of falling behind. And so it's nice to be able to say as a student, you know, I want to be able to practice the way I've been taught. I think that's really powerful. That's something I, in the state of Minnesota, where I'm currently practicing, I don't know. We have students at our clinic, but I don't know how many students come to the Capitol to speak with legislators on Mm -hmm. those topics. Because I I know if I speak on it, I can talk about, oh, what I learned 10 years ago, and mm-hmm. I learned, you know, using YAG lasers, mm-hmm. but I think being that you're in it, you can speak much more mm-hmm. on the hands-on experience and how that's going to echo in your choices going forward, being a doctor in the mm-hmm. state, choosing to stay in the state or practice there, and, and how that will impact not only you professionally, but then your patients and the community. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. So you've been involved in all of this with it, with mm-hmm. the AOSA. Mm-hmm. What motivated you even from the beginning? Because optometry school is a lot. Mm-hmm. You have a lot to study. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of training. Mm-hmm. But you've clearly been motivated from the beginning to be involved mm-hmm. in these political ways. What, what, what even drove you into that? I'm curious. I'm kind of like, I don't even know if I have a good answer as to what motivated me. I started as a first year student and I just knew I wanted to be involved. And so I ran for an AOSA rep position, which is kind of like the lowest type of position you can have at Ohio State. And I really enjoyed being involved in that. And then I started to see more and more what we could do. And I never knew optometry was so political in the first place. And then I started to learn about it. And then I attended events and then I started to become more and more interested and then you know I love optometry so much and it's benefited me so much in my life so I'm like I want to push this profession forward Mm -hmm. and I want me and my fellow classmates to be able to practice in the way that we're taught and so I just kept going deeper and deeper into it um, because there's so much that I, I like Even when I started school, I was like, this is like shocking what I'm being forced to learn and know. And we are so underrepresented in this like entire world where people don't recognize optometrists as doctors. And I'm like, I literally am learning extensively about the kidney right now. Like I know so much. So I want us to be recognized as true doctors and like, you know, people to come see us and trust us for their care and recognize we're not just one and two, you know, what's just better one and two, because I feel like that's what a lot of people think. Yeah, I think, you know, that is something that our profession does battle. Mm -hmm. And it's not just here in the United States, it's globally. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's some issues around that, just because our name as an optometrist in a lot of other parts of the world, it's synonymous with optician. Mm -hmm. And the education is not, in the United States, maybe different from around the globe. So I think there's definitely something Mm -hmm. to be said about that. So did you have a mentor? Did you have someone that said, hey... Uh, optometry is political, you need to get involved? How did, or was it purely just like, hey, there's an opportunity for me to um, to volunteer? Mm-hmm. I think it was kind of like an opportunity to volunteer, but I've met so many um, doctors along the way that have kind of continued to motivate me to 
to con- continue on with everything. Um, I've been very fortunate, like I said, to pra- like kind of work alongside the Ohio Optometric Association. So I've met so many of these doctors that really um, are heavily involved in our political organization in the state. Um, my One of my professors, Dr. Greg Nixon, he is like heavily involved in the Ohio Optometric Association. And um, I've like my first year when I went to something, it's called ODASH, Ohio's Day at the State House, where you go and speak with the legislators. I did it all with him. And like we had this group of people and it was me, my two friends and Dr. Nixon. And we were like the dream team. And we like always went into these legislators offices and we had these great conversations and they all were in agreement with us. So it was like, just like kind of helped me like get really excited about what I was doing and I've met so many other doctors along the way too that kind of have pushed me forward. I'm curious again because of your experience talking with legislatures and you've been with other doctors who've been doing this Mm -hmm. what are some tips or lessons you've learned and how to talk with these people who are making these decisions Mm -hmm. what what is your strategy or what kind of voices do you think about when you're about to go into a room Mm -hmm. and talk with them? I always think to myself, like, speak from the heart, really tell, but speak the truth as well. Mm -hmm. Like, we have the education to back us up. So present that in a way that shows you're passionate about it, but also truthfully, like, this is what I'm being taught and this is what I feel confident to do. Um, Another thing I, I always learned is when a legislator says, you know, I understand or I agree, you stop right there because you don't want to talk yourself back you want to stay where you are so you say thank you and you leave (laughs) so we always did that a lot because if they're kind of in agreement with you that's a good sign and you don't want to say something that could make them not agree with you so that's one of the biggest things is if you hear i agree you're done and so that was one thing i learned with dr nixon (laughs) i like that that's a good that's Mm -hmm. a good tip i appreciate that Mm -hmm. so with speaking Access to care mm-hmm. is a big component. It's something I know you're pretty passionate mm-hmm. about. Can you tell us about how access to care plays a role with kind of your passions with, with optometry and when it comes to like the future mm-hmm. of optometry? Yeah. So I had a lot of ocular issues growing up. I had congenital cataracts. And so um, when I was five years old, I had surgery, those were removed. So I've been seeing an optometrist for as little as long as I can remember. And I've been so fortunate that I had a great outcome, no strabismus, nothing like that. I mean, glasses, minimal correction with glasses. I need a bifocal, but you know, we deal. But so I've been so fortunate to have this kind of proper care throughout my life and good doctors who've taken care of me. And I was immediately, I saw the ophthalmologist, but they referred me right back to an optometrist. So I saw an optometrist for my whole life. Um, And so getting into school and kind of getting involved in various like community clinics, um, I've done like a, it's called a RAM trip, which is a remote area medical. Um, It's a pop-up clinic and they have an eye clinic in there. Um, I've rotated through a federally qualified health center. Um, So seeing all of that, I've realized not everybody's been as fortunate as I have. I've also done school vision screenings and there's nothing worse than seeing a kid who has a massive strabismus and it's they're seven years old and it's like it's never been caught before but you visibly are looking at them and their eye is turned in so i've realized many people aren't as fortunate as i have been in getting access to care um, especially in like rural communities and things like that whether it's insurance issues financial issues under proper understanding not enough providers nearby i've realized like there's just this lack for people to find proper access to care um, and so I think there's a real huge opportunity for optometrists to, you know, seek opportunities outside of their day-to-day practice. You know, find a pop-up clinic, start a pop-up clinic. Um, Ohio has a vision van that drives through Appalachia, Ohio, um, and provides free eyeglasses to children, parks at schools and does that. I'm like, you could consider starting like something like that in your state. It's just like, there's so many opportunities to be able to do it. So you just have to find a way to do it and get involved because you know, there's so many things that can be prevented with eye care if we just start at a certain point. The worst is when you catch it too late. Right. And you have such a, clearly you have a passion with it because you had such an amazing experience mm-hmm. at a young age, getting, having that condition caught and mm-hmm. then having a good pathway of coordination mm-hmm. with that care. Because you could try to imagine, I always think that, I'm like, God, could you imagine what it would be like how many decades ago, if that wouldn't have been done, well, how mm-hmm. that would have affected your life, mm-hmm. your potential for education, for just all the opportunities you've had. Mm-hmm. So it's it's amazing. And I think once you have those experiences, it's so much easier to give back as a provider in those ways. Mm-hmm. I want to take a quick break just to remind you about today's sponsor, 
Macu Health. If you are listening to this, then you probably care about eye health just as much as I do. Macu Health offers a line of incredible supplements that's formulated around published science. Macu Health is known for featuring the three most important carotenoids for your macula, lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. Whether you're managing age-related macular degeneration or simply looking to offer your patients a high-quality supplement you can trust, Macu Health has your back. Now, back to the episode. With going back to your involvement with politics, do you talk about access to care at all when you're talking either with legislatures or are you thinking about that in, in mm -hmm. terms of our profession with scope expansion? I think that's one of our biggest talking points because, you know, as you know, there's a lack of ophthalmologists in America mm -hmm. and there are certain procedures an optometrist is qualified to do that would alleviate some of the work that the ophthalmologist is doing and therefore open up more opportunities for patients to get the certain care that the ophthalmologist needs mm -hmm. to be doing. It's like a patient shouldn't have to wait three months for a YAG if an optometrist could just walk them down the hall and do that for them. And so we always talk about that because there's a lot of things that are eating up an ophthalmologist's time that doesn't need to be eating up their time. I mean, they don't need to be doing refractions or, you know, like we can be doing the refractions for them or we can be managing, you know, glaucoma where it doesn't need surgical intervention or we can monitor people's for their diabetes before it needs any sort of like injection or anything like that. So I think that we talk about kind of modernizing our scope because there is this lack of access to care and an optometrist could fill some of that issue. Um, we also talk about how in like the rural communities an ophthalmologist is like three hours away sometimes for these people to get certain procedures done. So if it's, you know, a lump and bump that's benign that an optometrist could remove, they could get that done in their hometown rather than have to drive three hours for that. Right. And then take a day off from yeah. work and all that kind of comes mm -hmm. with the pay more co-pays, maybe go through a, a whole nother examination. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially with advanced procedures or things like SLT, for example, mm -hmm. it basically should be a first line treatment now mm -hmm. for glaucoma. And usually optometrists are the primary provider who's making that diagnosis, mm -hmm. doing the testing, offering those treatments. Why couldn't we just perform that considering how safe it is, how mm -hmm. quick it is, how we're trained already and certified to do these sort of things? Again, I think it's a win-win-win across mm -hmm. the board. Absolutely. So I'm curious because you're a fourth-year student now, mm -hmm. right? You just started your summer fourth-year externship mm -hmm. rotation, mm -hmm. and you're at the VA, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, ex I'm interested in your experience and perspectives as a fourth-year student. First, I, I want to hear kind of your school experience because you... You went to school through the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. Started it kind of towards like the 2021 when it's like still kind of, we were like masked up in school, but we were still in classrooms, which was nice. We did some things online, but we were trying to get back into the regular education. But, you know, there's clinic with COVID precautions and masking and fogging of lenses and things like that. So that was definitely kind of like new for me is like how to navigate life through COVID, which is new for everybody. <laughs> how was class those early years? It were was, you doing a lot of Zoom? Were you, or? We were very fortunate at Ohio State. We were allowed back in the classroom. We just needed to wear masks for my first year. I think through the entire first year we were in masks. Um, but we luckily were doing traditional class, which was nice for me because I felt like it was very motivating sitting in a classroom, hearing a person speak directly to you, asking questions, being able to respond, things like that. So thinking about being a fourth year now mm -hmm. and thinking ahead for jobs and I imagine, are you planning on staying in Ohio? What's, what's, yes, what's your plan? I, I'm definitely planning on staying in Ohio. I, I love Ohio. I love Ohio optometry. I've gotten so involved in it from the beginning. My whole family's there. I, I couldn't see myself leaving the state. Now, of course, you can't speak for every student out mm -hmm. there. But just from your own feel of your classmates and, and what you know of what students are talking about, does scope expansion or just the the scope of a, of a particular state, how mm -hmm. heavily are students thinking about that in terms of where they go and practice? Is that a real big indicator or a factor for them? I have heard students say that they've considered leaving the state um, to be able to practice or to a certain 
degree. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely something that comes up when we're speaking with legislators a lot of times, just being able to say, like, you know, it, it really hits a pulls on a heartstring when a, a legislator hears that a potential worker is going to be leaving their state because they're not able to do what they've been trained to do. Um, so we've been we've had a lot of students kind of say, you know, I might consider leaving because there's like states so close to us that are more modernized scope. And so they're, you know, I could just go over the border to Kentucky or I could just go over to Indiana and be able to practice in a certain way, but Ohio doesn't allow us to. What about residencies? I'm curious because I know when I was a student, it was maybe 25, 30% of students mm -hmm. went on to residency. But when I first got into Tom School, I didn't even know a residency existed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just curious of what, what people's feelings are on that because mm -hmm. there's a lot of student student debts are higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of a lot of choices when it comes to your career. Mm -hmm. What's kind of what's your thoughts individually about residencies? But then again, what what do you think the your the feeling is of students interested, yay or nay, toward mm -hmm. residency? I think there is definitely a place for residency. I started school saying I was never going to do one because I was going to be in so much debt but the more i've gone through school the more i've considered one specifically because i've enjoyed so much time at the va mm -hmm. that i would consider doing one through the va i think there's definitely a place in the field for residencies if you want to fit specialty contact lenses if you want to work with children if you are really interested in bv these things kind of allow you to you know really hone in on the craft um, I do think that student interest is declining heavily with residency. I know particularly at least my class at Ohio State, um, a lot of students are kind of anti-residency and I think a lot of it is financial um, burdens of student debt, um, burnout from school, you kind of just want to get your job and start working. Um, I do think the education that I've received and especially from Ohio State and I'm sure other schools alike um, does adequately prepare you to begin practice. So if you're a person who's interested in primary care and you don't really have any sort of like subspecialty that you really want to hone in on, I think you're ready to kind of hit the ground running. If you're really into disease or something like that, maybe a residency would be good for you to kind of, you know, see more, be exposed to more, get more comfortable and treating and managing, knowing what you feel comfortable watching, what you feel needs to be referred out, things like that. Because I think starting off fresh from school, you might want to refer a lot more than you probably need to because you're just nervous about it. So I think it's a good thing to have. I don't think that residencies shouldn't be a thing. I just think there's also some people that may not need them. There's definitely some barriers to it, like mm -hmm. we said, with the price and the, just the financial aspect of it. What about the idea of private practice ownership because financially mm -hmm. if you're having a hard time imagining doing a residency and investing in that that same mentality how does that extend to being like i'm gonna buy into a clinic mm -hmm. or i'm gonna take out the loans to start my own clinic mm -hmm. what again what is your thoughts and then how is that conversation amongst your classmates mm -hmm. I don't hear a lot of people saying they want to own practices much anymore. I used to think I wanted to own my own starting school. I've kind of walked back on that. I just think the stress that comes with it, the financial burden, the fact that your practice becomes your child essentially mm -hmm. um, is a little daunting starting off. That's not to say later in life I wouldn't necessarily feel differently about that, but fresh out of school with the amount of debt that I already have, I couldn't imagine myself being like, well, let's just invest in this massive financial burden as well. Um, so I haven't heard a ton of students say that they want to own them. I would say there's some that are like, really gung-ho about it and are very business-oriented individuals. But I think I hear more commonly students saying, I would love to get into a private and buy partially into it. But nobody wants to be sole owner. I hear a lot of people, I'd love to be an associate, which I think is more reasonable because you feel like you're less, um, like less, like the sole responsible individual. You're not that person. You have other people that kind of are there to like guide you through it. Yeah. It's not just the financial mm -hmm. investment, but it's also the stress, the mm -hmm. time, the kind of commitment that yeah. comes with it. The burnout is very real, I feel, for a lot of private practice owners. Later in life, like, you know, you come close to retirement, I feel. I worked with some private practice doctors before, and I'd heard things that, like, it's just, it gets to be very tiring owning a business. I'm curious, because we're in kind of this conversation about, you know, scope and, and then residency, private practice, what are your, what's, where's your knowledge at and thoughts about private equity 
in Mm -hmm. optometry. Do you know much about that? I do. I do. I think private equity gets a pretty strong um, reputation in optometry. I think a lot of people think of them as the big bad um, individual who's buying up all the practices, taking away your rights. You can't be an individual if you're owned by private equity. Um, And I think that's the case for some, I'm sure, where you're kind of told what you're supposed to do. You're an employee and that's all you are. You show up, you see your patients and you do what they tell you to do. But I think there's some that kind of do allow you to practice as a more independent individual, make more decisions, see more disease. I think disease is kind of where things kind of start to um, get dicey with the private equity a lot of times. It's definitely, uh, some companies have different priorities mm-hmm. than others, but I think there's definitely a strong pro and con, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of times if you are you know, finishing school and you just want to get a good job with good benefits, that's consistent, there could be mm-hmm. a lot of pros to it. Or if you're a business owner who's looking to get out retirement, mm-hmm. you're looking to, it's like, again, that it's a might great be, exit strategy. It might, yeah. <laughs> um, so there's definitely pros and cons. And I know we have listeners who some have their own thoughts and feelings either direction. Mm-hmm. But it's I'm curious of like, as a student, you're aware of what private mm-hmm. equity is, right? Oh, yeah. And I think like, we've had a lot of private equity kind of show interest in having externs and things mm. like that from the school. Um, and so it's kind of like, for my class specifically, we're just a smaller class, so we kind of have the sites that we typically go to, and that's just kind of, bar- we barely have enough students to fill those half the time. So it's like we can't take them on, but some of them are feasible options. They allow you to, you know, use an OCT, get a visual field, like prescribe certain types of contact lenses. So they allow you to practice more fully than just a refraction station, basically. So um, I do think there's like a place for them um, in various communities. And um, if you're just looking to be, you know, an employee, you don't want the responsibility of owning a business. I think it could be a good option for people. So this is always a weird question, but with, with like board scores, those numbers get released and it's always a topic amongst mm-hmm. doctors talking about, oh no, hey, like our school did great. And there's this general trend, I think, of people kind of talking about how the scores haven't been doing as mm-hmm. well over maybe the last several years. Mm-hmm. And some people maybe have political discussions about that if it's because of education is, isn't doing as well or, or the st- student selection, getting into schools isn't well. There's all sorts of Mm -hmm. theories that get thrown out there. But I'm just curious from your perspective, what does that feel like for you and other students who are currently going Mm -hmm. through it? Uh, Can you just share kind of your thoughts and Mm -hmm. feelings? I think I have somewhat of a more unique, I guess, opinion on it because Ohio State traditionally performs very well on boards. We're always in the 90s. So when I was studying for boards, I felt okay studying. I felt like if every year the students are passing in 90%, 94, 96, whatever it may be, that I think I would be included in that, just based on how I'd been performing in school and things like that. I felt like I'd been prepared by my school and ready to take it on. Um, We often say at Ohio State, if a student doesn't pass the first time, it's not because they didn't know what they were doing, it's because they had a bad day. So I felt like I was more um, not confident because that's definitely not how I felt going into that test. I mean, I was stressed as can be, but it's like, I felt like I knew what to do to prepare. Um, But I think overall the scores are trending lower and I'm not really sure, I guess, why that is. Um, I don't necessarily think it's necessarily for every school that it's because they didn't know what they were doing. I think there's a lot of students who have eye anxiety, poor test performance, things like that. Um, So then they end up not passing the first time. But I wonder a lot of times, what is the disconnect? Why are there, why are we trending lower? Is it because students aren't being prepared adequately? I don't think student selection necessarily would be the issue. I think um, a lot of people can do hard things. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to kind of hit the books and grind, I think you can do it. You don't have to be the most intelligent individual. You just have have to have a good work ethic. Um, So I think it's not student selection, but is it there's a lack of knowing how to prepare? Is it unfamiliarity with a test of that degree? Are you not sure of how, like, I don't know how tests are taken at other schools, but I felt like some of the tests I had in school were really, really tough. So I'm like, okay, 
that was a pretty tough test, okay? Boards was also really tough, but I felt like I'd been challenged like that before. Um, so I know it's a really hot topic among students. I was afraid I wouldn't pass, as every student is, um, but I think I'm sure hearing that the scores are trending downward also affects students' morale preparing for it. You hear that they're down, you're thinking, oh my goodness, am I going to be one of the students that doesn't hit the mark this time? Um, so I don't really know what the solution would be, but I know like there's a bunch of study tools and things like that, but I don't even think those are necessary. I think it all starts at you know, the fundamental level and beginning to prepare yourself day one. And maybe it's because people are really overwhelmed in their first year, so they're not hitting some of those hard classes, things like that. But it's a very hot topic because you've got to pass this one to become a doctor. And I know a lot of people will pass part two and three, but they won't pass part one. And so then it kind of is like, oh my goodness, I can't be a doctor because I can't pass the first one, but I passed the second two. So it's kind of a weird thing. And I don't know what what needs to be done to fix that. This is a kind of an out of left field in a way, but I've talked with other educators and one educator mentioned to me that they felt that there's just a generational difference mm -hmm. of how younger generations learn. And mm -hmm. that may include even my generation, you know, 10 years ago when I went to school, but that perhaps social media, access to smart, constant access to smartphones and being able to look things up have changed the way people think mm -hmm. and learn. Do you, what are your thoughts on, on that idea? That's why I'll be kind of curious about like how this new part three goes down because I would be curious to see if students perform better in this because they're being challenged in a way that doesn't require you to spew out information on an, a test, but you're thinking critically about something. And so some of these students that may not hit the mark on part one might perform well on part three because, okay, I couldn't remember that random fact about that random disease I never will ever see in my entire life, but I do recognize what diabetic retinopathy is and I do know where to send this patient or what to do for this patient in that case. Um, so I wonder if that's kind of a good way for NBO to begin investigating what the disconnect is here to see if students need to be challenged in a way that requires them to think more critically rather than just pure memorization and spewing a formula out from optics or pulling out a random systemic disease that is so rare you're never going to even see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, I know, again, we always, I was a student once and I remember looking through those things and learning some of these mm -hmm. rare, you yeah. know, go sell glaucoma, how else am I going to see that? Mm -hmm. And then the reality hits when you're yeah. actually looking at something in the clinic, you're like, is this could this possibly be this condition yeah. is this is this big chats like what, yeah. what's going on so it's it seems sometimes unreal when you're studying it mm -hmm. as a student but it, it, it can be home. out there you it's know, not rare if it's in your chair as they often say at ohio state <laughs> yeah it's it's very true so considering all that you've been doing in the aosa considering kind of how you've been getting trained in your education I'm curious of your thought about our profession going forward. How do you envision either yourself or just the profession as a whole evolving in the next, mm -hmm. let's say, 10 years? I think we have a big opportunity to rise to the occasion, you know, as the technology modernizes, our scope and practice should modernize as well. We should follow the trend, not be afraid of it. Um, I think we have this huge opportunity as optometrists to kind of step up and prove what we're able to do um, and show individuals what we're capable of treating and managing for them, how we can be a part of their overall care team, how we can really fill a role. We aren't just glasses and contacts, we have a lot more to offer. So I think as you know, the population ages and technology advances and scope hopefully expands for our field, um, we can kind of fill some of those voids, especially with lack of care with ophthalmologists half the time too. Do you work closely with ophthalmologists either at your current rotation or have you had much experience working with them in your education? I have not yet. Um, my VA is very rare. There's actually no ophthalmologist there, so we're the only eye clinic at the VA, but I know that that's not typically the case. So we'll get just about anybody who has an eye problem in rural Ohio coming in because we're who they know um, is available to them, and then we'll refer as needed. But um, it is really interesting to see what some of the doctors out there are capable of managing and watching. I'm really impressed to come and see that, you know, one doctor's like, oh, yeah, I, I feel comfortable watching that. And I was like, wow, that's 
wild, I probably would have kicked him out the door because <laughs> I don't think I'd feel comfortable. But when you know you get, you know, when you're kind of relied on as that sole provider, you kind of know what you're capable of and what your limitations are as well. And you also learn over time. Mm-hmm. That's just the, the true reality of, of experience. Mm-hmm. And especially when you start off in your career, like it, you kind of said that earlier, it's it's normal to refer things out. It's okay mm-hmm. to do that. What's even more important that I try to uh, educate to the students I have is that if you are referring it out, that's fine. Just follow up, mm-hmm. learn from that. Ask, even calling up that other provider on the phone, asking more questions about that case, uh, what their insight is on it, so that you can not only form a better relationship with them, which mm-hmm. is golden, but also so that you can kind of learn from that and then dive deeper so that next time, maybe you don't need to refer that out. Maybe you can manage mm-hmm. that. And it's just, it's part of the growth experience. So, this is a big question. I love an- kind of ending with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so our viewers and listeners already kind of know this is coming. But when it comes to where you're at now, and I know, again, you're a student. You've got a lot of mm-hmm. things on your mind yeah. you're preparing for. If you were, let's say you graduated and you were elected, hey, we want you to run the to be like kind of the surgeon general of optometry. We want you to step up on like a federal level mm-hmm. to lead optometry into the the next year what would be like the number one thing that means the most to you that you want to see change for the better for the profession or for community for the public what what would be you think is Mm -hmm. most important to you i think i got two things i'll say one would be um kind of better public awareness of what an optometrist is like i've said before we aren't just one and two and i think people need to come to realize that i also think ophthalmology needs to come and kind of realize that as well so that we're able to kind of fill a void in various communities throughout the country um, provide quality care really change people's lives another thing i would probably say is expand access to care get optometrists out in the rural communities get ophthalmologists to undertake some optometrists to work alongside them so that we're providing more comprehensive care perhaps that way in the rural communities these optometrists could see some of the things that originally an ophthalmologist was going to see Um, i think there's this huge opportunity for optometrists to kind of grow as a profession and show what we're able to do and what we're capable of. Um, So I think we need to kind of first get people to become aware of who we are and also get ourselves out there working with those people as well. Well, very well said. I think uh, both of those are super important. I think the getting ophthalmology on board with optometry, I think it's sort of it's sort of building up that mm-hmm. way. It really depends on the relationship and, and the surgeon that you're working with. But it, I think it, the numbers mm-hmm. are clear in terms of the aging population, the amount of residents going into ophthalmology. There is a high demand for high le- end medical care mm-hmm. in, eye, in the eye care field. And we as optometrists with our training, our knowledge, we're the best equipped to fill in and really serve people the Mm -hmm. best, Uh, but in collaboration, right, with ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. Well, Maggie, from here, I just want to say thank you so much for being here as being our first student guest. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) And congratulations again on your uh, American Optometric Student of the Year Award. Thank you so much. That's huge. So that was our episode for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you are somebody who is deeply passionate about our profession or gives a damn about a specific topic that may be affecting our industry in some way, please let us know either in the comment section over on YouTube or in the review section. Leave us a solid review on whatever your favorite podcasting platform is and let us know if there is a person in our industry that you would love to hear from or perhaps a specific topic that you would like to uh, hear here in more of a deeper conversation on this podcast. Otherwise, thank you so much again for listening in. I hope you have a fantastic day and we'll see you in the next episode.